All right, so let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Thank you for joining our marketing panel. Uh, glad to see you. Um, we'll start with some introductions. Um, so uh, to the panelists, if you'd like to tell the audience who you are, what you do, who you work with, let's start there. So, so Greg, please. I'm Craig Rose. I'm a professor here. Um, I work with the uh, marketing faculty, the faculty in general. And, uh, <laughs> I'm Quincy. I am the co-owner and CEO of Campfire, just up the block and down the block that way in a couple months. Uh, prior to starting that, I spent about nine years in marketing agency life and freelance life. Um, yeah. Or that I was the touring musician. So well, I, like play, to, what, what I play keys. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't great at it, but I was, I was good enough to jam a little, bit, a little bit. I'm Scott Smith. I'm the VP and uh, Chief Marketing Officer for YMCA of Pierce and Kitsap Counties. Uh, and, uh, I've been in marketing longer than I care to remember, but. Uh, <laughs> For a number of years, I've uh, been through tech, been through healthcare, been through uh, clinical research in my background, lots of B2B experience. Uh, really excited to be a part of the Y now, the nonprofit world, and uh, dealing directly with the public. And I'm Ryan Zilker, uh, Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer at Sound Credit Union, right at the road. Um, it's not, I've been in the uh, industry and marketing for a long time longer than many of you have probably been alive. <laughs> um, and uh, I've been mostly B, B to C. Um, so so it's, it'll be interesting to hear kind of our different different takes on it. So glad to be here. So so Greg, I, I hear yeah. you had an interesting um, trajectory to get into marketing. Oh, uh, in terms of, um, you may be, it's, I was, I've been in marketing for quite a while in a whole bunch of different ways. Oh, maybe it's um, how you got into academia? Well, it's, there's many different ways. <laughs> That's interesting too, but um, yeah, no, I had an interesting trajectory. I um, I was originally, I majored in political science, thought about going to law school. It didn't look like, it. at the time they said there was too many lawyers. There were always too many lawyers, but they usually find jobs and make more laws. But anyway, that's that's a different story. So I, I uh, then I just kind of, I, I worked in marketing. Um, I was in um, marketing research. So I was doing, uh, my, you know, just a, projects, copy testing, testing ads, stuff like that. And then um, I, I went back, uh, got my MBA, got some product management experience. And during the MBA, I wrote a, a thesis and that led to me getting a PhD eventually. And it's worked out. Hey, Quincy, how do you go from keyboards into agency work? How'd that happen? <laughs> I had uh, decided that the touring life was just too hard. I'd done it for about four years, and I don't know if anybody here has ever dabbled in music, but touring is not as glamorous as TV makes it seem. Um, so I hadn't made up my mind at the time I was finishing my master's in marketing. And so I just kind of knew that I was going to make that transition, but it was really the serendipitous thing. I was freelancing when I wasn't on tour. I was working with a client in Pioneer Square. And um, we were on a photo shoot or something like that. And I saw this company across the hall. And I was like, oh, wow, they got, they got a really cool logo. Now at the time, I had just started my PhD in organizational psychology, which I was using to have a better framework around why marketing in groups does or doesn't apply or work. And so I was like, oh, this is fast and I wonder what they do. And just so happened as I was going to their Facebook page at the time, uh, they had posted a job for a marketing manager. I applied and got the job. And so there goes the, the touring career for, for real, for real. And within a year, I was partnering the agency, running small businesses and nonprofits. And yeah, that was that was a good little run. I still worked with some musicians though too. It was just from a marketing capacity, was, you know, smaller labels would contract us out. I got to help strategize these plans and stuff. So. Nice. 
stayed in music. Now I'm like, not really in music at all. I'm in coffee land. <laughs> <laughs> and Scott, how did you, you said you've been in marketing for, for a little while. Yeah. How did you get your start in marketing? How did I get my start in marketing? Um, uh, I, got a, I got a gig at a title company doing flyers on PageMaker. That's how long ago that was. Wow. Um, so, uh, yeah. Has anybody in here heard of PageMaker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, PageMaker. Yeah, PageMaker. Yeah, I just dated myself there. So. Um, yeah, so so that, that's how I got in. Uh, then I ended up getting into, then the tech boom happened. I got uh, into a couple of entrepreneurial gigs where I was the one and only point of contact for marketing. That was when the web was in its infancy. Uh, when I graduated college, I didn't have much of a way of, uh, background in terms of what digital was. It was all traditional marketing. Uh, so I really had to learn uh, as I went. And, you know, the, the constant evolution of technology from uh, the web through social media, through um, now the demand generation, marketing automation, data, uh, that's, that's where I just kept learning. And uh, it kept carrying me through my career. Um, so yeah, I mean, I could go on and on, but you know how long my career is, so <laughs> I'll pause there. <laughs> and what, what did you study in college? Uh, communications, I went okay. to Cal State Fullerton. That's where I got my, my MBA. Yeah. yeah. Go, go taste. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Cool, cool. And so I'll share, share my story too. I had maybe a little less traditional trajectory. So my undergraduate degree is in environmental biology. Wow. Um, I was working as a teller at a credit union uh, when I graduated, and uh, I was offered a position in the in, the, in their management training uh, program, so I thought, okay, I'll give this a shot. And uh, from there, I was recruited into marketing as a marketing researcher. Um, and so the way I describe it is, uh, whether you're counting frogs in a pond or counting how many people want your checking account, it's the same applied math, right? So that's it's kind of the same approach, just different different subject matter. So um, that's how I started, and then I learned learned marketing on the job, and then I went back and got my MBA about ten years into my career. So that's to demonstrate that it can be a, a non non traditional trajectory for sure. So, okay, so um, got a really broad question for the panel. I'd like to get everybody's thoughts on it. What does a marketer do? Greg, should we start with you? Professor. <laughs> <laughs> you when you want to look busy and like you know what you're doing, everybody always asks that question, especially in accounting. They always ask what does market, marketing do. I think what, what marketing does is it's it's not just sales. It's really kind of understanding your customers and figuring out what they need, which which type of customers, the different type of customers, and then uh, basically, you know, what what do you, what can you do to Number one, you know, fulfill their needs, but also what can you do to, to make money? Essentially, that's how I look at it. Like it. I'm up. I always say marketing is psychology for capitalists. It's essentially you're just trying to figure out the environments, the behaviors of the people you're trying to reach and how you can connect to them. And in order to do that, you got to spend some time with them, do some research, know some stuff. Um, but that, yeah, I mean, that's a good, to me, it's, its main function is like that of the psychologist is understanding human behavior, human drivers, and then whatever your end goal is, you can apply it to that. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sim uh, most simply put, I think it's, Awareness. You, you need to build awareness. Uh, and uh, to, to Quincy and Greg's point, I mean, it's uh, it's really about um, you can sort of reverse engineer however you want to get into that and study, uh, you know, who your targets are, what your market is. But you're 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 either creating awareness within the market, uh, educating the market about something. Uh, protecting your brand within the market and spreading awareness from a consistent basis. Um, it's really, you know, at the end of the day, it's mostly about awareness and how you're trying to drive that 
type of action that you want your, your target to, to make. I like it, yeah. yeah. I, I'd probably add to a couple of things that marketing does not do. And I, and I, I take this approach quite a bit, it, it sound. First of all, we are not the make it pretty department. It, there's nothing more offensive to a marketer. Than, yeah, really? Can you pretty this up for us? Like, like no, we like we we do more than that. So, so that that's kind of offensive. Um, and so the other thing that I say is we're not going to put lipstick on a pig. Like, if the product sucks or if we don't have the support for something, we 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 can't make it better just by marketing it, right? <laughs> so, so th those are some of the things I talk about that we are not. So. Um, Greg, you talked about how accounting, how sometimes we have to convince accounting. Oh, we're also not a cost center. We're not just an expense center. But that's the other thing we're not. So we have to convince it, uh, the accounting and our CFO and the rest of the organization of this. So I, to the whole panel, I'll just throw it out for the group. What approaches do you have in your broader organization to demonstrate the importance and the value of marketing? Whoever likes to jump in. So, uh, I honestly think relationships matter. So it's just, uh, you, you need to build consensus. You need to build consensus, uh, be able to present concepts and so forth, uh, be able to manage up to anybody uh, at, at the leadership level or your, you know, your capital angel investors about you know, the programs that you're taking and the marketing plan that you have. Uh, um, you, so be, but you can only do that Relationships really aid in that. Um, and so uh, communications, uh, being able to, um, to tell your story in, in a way that uh, you, can, you can collaborate effectively and then also get your team to buy into the concept uh, and, and move forward, I think, is, uh, is key. Thanks. Yeah, I would piggyback that. I mean, gosh, Scott hit it on the head. Communication is... What I learned when I was in an in agency world and we're, you know, before I started on my side of small businesses and nonprofits, we were working primarily with Microsoft, right? And so there's a lot of stakeholders there that you have to convince. And what one tack that I learned pretty quick is it's not necessarily the guy who has the best idea, it's the one who can communicate it the clearest and most concise. You could have a trash idea, but if you can get that point across and somebody that's sitting across the table can get it and say, oh, oh well, yeah, let's absolutely dump money, then you win, right? I mean, there were plenty of times where I thought that I had a great strategy for Microsoft to implement on some event they were doing. I just couldn't find the appropriate words to make it sticky. And I would always leave the meeting talking to, you know, the other team members like, Man, what, what is it? And I'll never forget Melissa who ran the agency and eventually became partners with. She just said, you, you got to figure out how to communicate this in like two seconds, two sentences or less. So, yeah. And, and I even do that now. Like, right. Like I got to an answer to my boss and my wife. Right. <laughs> she really runs campfire. I got the fancy title, but she runs the show. And you know, whenever we're kicking around ideas about growth or new campaigns or whatever, it's, I have to convince her. She's not a marketer, right? I can't, I can't go in with a bunch of jargon and trends and metrics and like, she's, you know, she was a military girl. She's like, give it to me straight. That's it. If I can give it to her straight, then she'd be like, oh yeah, that's great. We should do that. A matter of fact, I actually told you we should do that two weeks ago, but I'm not taking credit. That's how she does it. <laughs> So yeah, communication, massive. I think we can touch on a lot of a lot of things, the importance of communication, but also, <laughs> also the importance of, of tailoring your communication. So sometimes you know relationships are important, but it's also important to, to be aware of who you're speaking to. And you know, sometimes you actually speak accounting because that's what people are gonna be persuaded by. You got to show them you know you're gonna make money and this is what the contribution is and, and these sort of things. Other times it may be a different types of conversation. Yes. Yeah, I think I think you all hit on really important aspects of that. Um, my CEO, for example, is a CPA. So I need to I need to talk dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's a whole different challenge. And so so it's about communicating in a way that that he understands. 
which is really what as marketers we do for our outside community or outside audience. We just have to retailer that for inter internal audience as well. So we've talked about relationships. We've talked about communication. What are some other really important skills for marketers? And then the second part of that is how can somebody seeking their first marketing job demonstrate that skill set to us over hiring? It's a big one, right? That's a biggie. Yeah. Give me the first part again. Yeah. <laughs> so, so other than communication uh, and building relationships, what other skills are important for marketers? Writing. Yeah. Writing. Uh, it's it's a skill that um, will will serve you well long term throughout your career. Uh, uh, that goes leans back into communication. Um, and it's something that not everybody can do well. And uh, a lot of people like to lean on technology and that's good and well, but uh, at the end of the day, if you're not able to articulate, again, your ideas uh, or your message uh, or to be able to, to deliver a concept, um, you're, you're not gonna win. And, uh, I, I honestly think Writing's where I started. That, that's what that's what got me to where I am today. And I, I, I was uh, I, I was at Sage for ten years as a writer, and then moved my way up into an associate creative director position. Totally invaluable experience because I was dealing with so many different markets and so many different personas, and the ability to iterate my, our messages. We had a huge team, and so we were just able to, to really hone in our communications, our messaging platform. Uh, and at the end of the day, I mean, it, it really served us well. We were able to compete against Microsoft and SAP and a lot of big names in business management. And uh, uh, I mean, writing will always serve you. Writing will always serve you in, in any position uh, that you decide to take in life. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with that more. And as a guy who studied science, I am not strong in writing, and I think that's probably been my biggest challenge in my career. So I think that that very good advice, sage advice, if you will. Sage. No <laughs> 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 yeah, I'll jump. I think a good skill. I think it. Well, maybe it's, and they might grow up playing sports. Perfect, because one thing that I think aided me well early on as a marketer was knowing how to lose. It sounds weird, but I had to learn how to like, so when, in my teams growing up, I, I'm the youngest of five boys. They were all far more phenomenal athletes than me, um, but I was very competitive. So the idea of losing was just not in my makeup when I got into the professional world. But you get there and you realize, okay, now you're on a team with a guy like Scott, who's been in this game and knows more than you, or knows exactly what you know and can do it 10 times better than you. And so you might not get that opportunity right away to just jump in and show how great you think you are and how great you probably are. So it's, I think it's just, you know, having that ability to display humility and and be the quietest guy or girl in the room and absorb information when i learned that and i learned it quick because excuse my friends i got my ass handed to me i walked into agency life thinking that i was a hot shot nice cushy job good paycheck they must be giving me this because i'm worth something and i was but I didn't know what I was getting into. Like, I, I didn't know marketing tech. I didn't know that world, but I learned it quick. And I learned that I needed to sit back and just listen to, to the smarter people in the room. So I had to learn how to lose really quick. But I think that my, you know, playing three sports growing up and having four older brothers taught me how to learn how to lose really fast. And I was able to flip that switch and it aided me well to the point where I was so hardwired to then just be the guy who learned the most as opposed to being the smartest guy in the room, if that makes sense. 
that when my time came, I was prepared. And then that's when they said, hey, look, this is actually something that we want you to prove a concept in. And if you can do this for nine months, we can talk about implementing this further, which that's how I ended up becoming a partner in a small agency. But in terms of like revenue, we, we were doing all right. So, but it was having that piece of humble pie. So I think, you know, on the second part of that question of how do you display it is, again, communicating to people that that's what you're there to do. Like, I'm here to be a team player. Like, I know that's like super jargony resume buzzword crap that really doesn't mean nothing. But if you can actually be a real team player and really play your role, it will serve you better in the long run. And I think the point about humility is really important because as awesome as all of your ideas are going to be, some are going to fail. And if you can recognize it and say, okay, that didn't work. What can I learn from it? And how do I adjust and redo it so it's better and it does work next time? That's really important. And I've seen marketers who have too much hubris and they're not willing to call their baby ugly. And they just keep going with it. That was that guy. Yeah. It, 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 is, it is not good for the long-term career. Yeah. If I could add just real quick. Sometimes you'll have a really good idea that will just get shot down. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't for sure. matter. Yeah. Because the boss or whoever your client is says, no, I don't want to go. That's like, oh, yep. oh, yep. okay. Yep. All right. Okay. Let's go to option B. But, but those are great to stick on a shelf. Yeah. Because there's going to be another opportunity that you can pull it out for. Oh, yeah. So like, I, don't throw it away. No. Keep, keep it in your, in your back pocket. So, and I think that, you know, on that note, it's, it's similar. You know, I was thinking about the people, it's flexibility, um, it's learning, and it's also just like, well, that didn't work. What now? We better do something different. You know, I was thinking about the people I know that have been successful. And one of the things that's kind of nicer about being older is, you know, how everything worked out for people. Sometimes it's a little bit not what you'd hope, but a lot of times it's really good. And the people I know that have really succeeded They've had some rough times. I know guys, you know, like they would literally have to run to the bank to cash your paycheck before anyone else because it wasn't going to bounce, you know, it's stuff like that, you know, and, and they worked, it worked out for them because they, they stayed with it and they just kept working. What's interesting too, I think, is that um, for those of us who've been doing this for a while, we think, oh, we've seen these trends, we've done these promotions in the past, we know it's going to work, but society is changing so quickly that what worked five years ago may be a complete flop today. And so I'm always learning and always trying to practice humility and demonstrate learning, but it's, it's not always easy. Okay. So we, we talked about some important um, attributes and skills. Um, Quincy talked a little bit about how we can demonstrate how new applicants can demonstrate those skills. Scott or Greg, do you have any other thoughts on how an applicant might demonstrate their, their skills? Yeah, you know, it's difficult when you come out of school because uh, you don't have the, the resume. You don't have the experience line. I like to think about a, a resume in quadrants. You've got the education part handled. Sure. You've got uh, some skills that you can lean on. Um, you don't have the experience part. That last quadrant, I think, is... What, what are you doing in the community? What types of things are you doing uh, within your own environment? What types of volunteerism are you doing? Uh, I think that that helps a lot of students to stand out uh, above other applicants and other candidates uh, coming right out of college. So I, I really, um, you know, I, I, I really recommend if that's not something that you're involved in yet, uh, to think about it because it really adds that balance uh, that a lot of employers are looking for. Greg, anything you got? I think, I think there's, there's a lot to be said for, as we just said, being involved, just being involved in general. I mean, coming to events like this, getting to know people, um, getting internships early on, you want to make every move you can so to, to put yourself out there. And you know, those, are, those are, I think, the important things. Yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be paid to be to go on the resume for sure. Yeah, yeah like actually, were you just add something? Oh, one more, one more. So if if 
you're coming and you, there's not a lot of experience on the resume. Well, there's there you 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 should know the company and you should be knowledgeable. You should you should do the work before the interview because if you come in without experience and they say, "Why oh, this person to do anything?" They don't know anything. In fact, at, at a firm that one of my daughters uh, works at, if they mispronounce the firm's name wrong, that's bad, <laughs> real bad. <laughs> you know, so yeah, you know, yeah, you work here. Yeah. You should know that, or you want to work here. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Do your homework and have some questions ready. I mean, really express an interest, and but also express, you know, uh, as you're talking with them, where you can add value because they're they'll present those. Uh, as opportunities during the interview uh, and you should key in on that and go that's it I'm so glad you brought that up because here's here's where I can help you here's here's something that I did you know uh, through volunteerism or you know being involved in school uh, so I, I honestly think uh, how you connect yourself to how you can help them uh, along with to uh, Greg's point just being knowledgeable about the the organization is really going to help you so when we think about the marketing discipline, the umbrella, it's, it's pretty broad. There's research, design, management, digital, all sorts of things. Um, for somebody new in their career, they might have like dabbled in some of the, some of the topics, might not have a lot of depth. What would be your advice? Should they, should they go deep on something that interests them? Should they be kind of generalist and know a, a little bit about a lot of topics? What's the best approach for, get, for landing their first marketing job? Mm. So I was the guy that was like a little bit of everything. Yeah. I don't know if that served me very well, though. I, it got me in the door in places, and especially as a freelancer, because I could, I could speak intelligently enough to a business owner about, you know, what they are trying to accomplish. And I could ask the right questions and come up with something. Hey, this is what I got. But I feel like I had more impact when I got deep on the strategy side. Because then I could go into a room and kind of hit the points that I think the decision makers cared about, which was who's going to do it, why are we doing it, how are we going to do it, and most importantly, how much it's going to cost. And, you know, when I would create a strategy, right? Like, relationship, communication, asking the right questions with a client, whether it's, you know, the nonprofit down the street or Microsoft, it was always, you know, learning the room, right? Learning who you're talking to. And then you could, I could, in my experience anyway, um, I feel like I had a better hit rate at that point, you know, as opposed to just kind of like, yeah, I can do design. Like I do that now, but it's my company, right? I can do all of the design and the strategy and the, you know all the things. Um, and the social, which I, you know, running a business, you don't do social very well. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like it served me much, much better when I decided to go really, really deep on strategy. Yeah, that's where things started to really click, and I felt like I was in a groove. And I started to kind of build a reputation around that. Like, oh, Quincy, he's a good strategy guy. Like, because I wasn't really great. I wasn't great at design. I was good enough. I wasn't great at social. I was good enough. And I knew how to move things on the fly, looking at different metrics and trends. And I had all the tools to do it. I mean, I was really great at it. I could just say some stuff. But strategy became my, like, bread and butter. And so... But, but again, I'm rambling now, but it didn't happen until I decided this is what I'm focusing on. I'm going to go deep as opposed to continuing to go wide. It did, the wide made me valuable if I needed to step in. Mm -hmm. If I had a designer, like I did, for example, I did a product launch for REI in 2016 or 2017, and I kind of came in late on it. And I had to hire out designers. Well, the designers that I hired out had never worked with REI before, but because I had some background in knowing what a style guy was and, you know, all these different things, like I had to do the first preliminary and then they built off of that. So there was some benefit in it, even as I moved along in my career, but I just, 
it was far and few between that the wide really helped yeah. you know, yeah. later. Good, thanks. Gregor Scott, anything to add? Um, so, I mean, great points that Quincy made. Uh, so many people like to just jump right into tactics. So uh, it's, it is important to, to be able to, to know what to say when you're talking about marketing in terms of what, what are our objectives? What are we trying to accomplish? Who are, we, who are our targets? Uh, you know, uh, did, have we done something like this before? Um, just kind of walking through all of these things super important having the 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 generalist approach as as i like to call it it does help you and does serve you over time uh, especially if you want to get into a leadership role or run, run a business uh um i think that uh you know to to again to quincy's point that enables you to step in you know the discipline you know how to help uh you know how to find resource uh the one piece of advice I might add is that there, there's a saying that if you're doing something that you love, you never work a day in your life. So if you're enjoying something within marketing, there's something that is drawing you into it, whether it's social media or it's design or it's writing or any number of, of the disciplines that are out there, uh, go ahead and get into it. You know, I mean, because that's just gonna that's just gonna take you further to and help you decide whether or not, you know, I like, I like a broad menu. I want to be a generalist. I want to be a leader. I want to know all the disciplines or I really want to specialize. I want to be a specialist. I really want to know how to get 50,000 Instagram followers or I, I really want to know how to, you know, you know, billboards or, you know, whatever. There's a bazillion things that you could do to specialize in, in marketing, but do, do something that, that speaks to you though, that, you feel like you have some aptitude for and that you enjoy because that's gonna that's gonna serve you in your career being able to do something you enjoy. Absolutely. My my first reaction was it, it depends on you and it does depend on you. And I think you know having listened to the to, to you all speak it, it also I, I think that's right. You know do things that you're that you're passionate about. I do think early on in a career it's probably good to have a specialization that'll help you land the first job. But um you know, do do what interests you. Like there's, you know, there's an emerging um, want or desire for marketing analytics, but that's not everybody. Some people are interested in that. Some people are going to like that. Some people may decide that that even though maybe they're not naturally that way, they can they can do it. They can do it well enough to get a job. I mean, honestly, many years ago, that's what I did. I I, I did I got into numbers. I'm not really a number guy, but it got me a job. So yeah. you know. But you know, but if there's something you're passionate about, do it. I think specialization is helpful. And again, just get as many opportunities as you can. Uh, all great advice. And just for a little bit different perspective, I started as a specialist, as a data guy and a researcher. And from there, I was able to kind of expand and, and learn. And as I'm in a leadership role now, I think that those specialists, like you were talking about, Scott, are so important, like because they know the day to day inner workings of social media or graphic design. That heaven help us if I had to try to do some design work, it would not be good. I'd use PageMaker probably. <laughs> um, so I, I think that, uh, but like like Greg said, follow your heart, and if, if you have if you have an interest in a general generalized role, pursue that. If you have a a passion for a particular function of marketing, pursue that. Um, I don't want to embarrass her, but our marketing coordinator is in the back of the room. And she, so can Tia, and she started uh, with us. She, she came in, um, I read her resume as a generalist, and we have found that she's a badass writer and designer. Hmm. And so she's like starting to flex those muscles, right? So we're starting to see her like her, her specialization shine through. And it's, uh, it's really cool to see that. And I, I think uh, as you're looking for, you know, early career jobs, that's the type of an organization that you would probably want to find something that can help you grow and, and really flex your muscles and find your passions. For sure. Content. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> so for, for the audience too, as we're going along, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hands. Love to make this interactive. Uh, if you have any thoughts as we're going along. Thoughts, 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 please. Thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. Yes. 
Uh, so I just graduated, but I have noticed that I do like more of a generalist. Mm -hmm. But to become like, it's basically become how to become a manager, and you have to know so many things to become that. So it seems like I wanted my plan so far was to try get hired. I don't know, data analyst, because of that meeting there, I'll see how that works. Maybe the other thing works, and then maybe eventually I'll make it, you know, it'll build me to become a good manager. But then I'm also wondering what if I'll just be wasting time and energy on doing things that I really should just hire somebody else to do. How do I? It's a long leap. Like you can't just become a generalist or like a manager. You have to build there. You know, people are not just going to show up and tell people what to do. People are like, you, can, you have to know. Yeah. So thoughts? I have thoughts. Of course. <laughs> Why you okay. So, so, so I, I think it's going to depend on what kind of finding the right opportunity. So, so, I mean, you might be able to find like a coordinator or specialist type role that really might be a generalist. And that might be a way to get your foot in the door with a marketing organization. Or you could go down that specialization path learn that discipline really well, and then start to expand. So I think you have a few few paths you can take, um, and that might prepare you to take on the, the manager role in the future. They're like an um, assistant of somebody could become. <laughs> just just joke. No, it's a good because point. I think you want to. Mark and your assistant, I'll do every whole You want to make sure that you, you accept a role where you have an opportunity to learn. You know, uh, so you're. Uh, whether it be your superior or your peers or, um, you know, or whether you're working with an agency, uh, are there, you'll gain opportunities to learn and will you gain the, the opportunities that you're looking for? So I think that's, that's something to consider. You don't want to be the lone wolf in marketing when you're, when you're trying to be, uh, you know, the generalist, because then uh, you, you'll, you'll kind of feel isolated. So you'll, I think, having having a, a position maybe in a team environment. And to uh, to Ryan's point, whether you go down a specialist path or a generalist path, as long as there are opportunities for you to continue to learn and grow, or for you to learn from somebody, um, I think will help you get there faster. Yes, I don't have a marketing background. More like engineering operations and stuff. I'm in the MBA program. It's something that I always wondered, but I didn't get in, didn't understand or learn about my marketing classes. So I guess marketing, you're about sales and advertising, what your company has to offer. How do you know what your company is capable of offering? So I'm not like, for example, like a larger engineering company or a company that can ask offer lots of services. I feel like I don't understand. How could you know? How, how do you have meetings or organize like at the YMCA, maybe you can offer some special new yoga class because one of your, somebody working at the gym that you have in one location can do that and know that, hey, this is an opportunity to expand the business and we need to focus on this. How do you get fed that information? So I, I, um, I think that it, it really depends on, it, it's different between, you know, engineering and say the you know programs at the YMCA but for as far as the Y goes you know we look at what what it is that our community is 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 asking for and gravitating toward and we continue continue down that path um, to to try to drive uh, you know this so if, gym, if, it, if the gymnastics program takes off then we add levels to that how so, do you know that how do you know what the community wants or what's because they participate and they, they register for those programs and they, and they come and they show up and we can see that you know we've got 90 percent attendance rate uh, so really the data at the end of the day tells the story the ability to to, to convert sales of your engineer you know uh i don't know what, what your phone does necessarily but yeah. what however you're convert, however you're making money now is really what tells the story. And so how, how is it that you can add to that from a growth standpoint, as well as to diversify into other offerings? Um, is, is, that's kind of the path. And, and sorry, I'm sorry, it's just really interesting to me. Uh, so how do you do it? Um, if you don't have, if, you, if it's a pilot program and you don't have any data on it, like, you know, some fad for, I think, I'm trying to think of in YMCA terms, some fad that 
some new program like when Zumba came out or something came out and you have no data on it, maybe in, maybe the consulting company. I've, I've got a perfect case study for you. So we're on October 1st, we're launching the world's first hybrid membership offering. Um, it's going to be available online through our virtual platform, but you'll also have you'll be able to come in and visit one of the centers once a month for 25 bucks. Wow. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, no, we, we have no data on this. We're just going for it. And so um, what you do is you create a minimum viable product. You think that you have something uh, and, and you go from there. Uh, the, the virtual part is currently included in the full membership price, but there are people who, who don't have an opportunity to come into the centers. We still want them to be connected to the centers in case they do get that opportunity. So it's really kind of keeping them in our, in our hub, keeping the members in our hub, but giving them an opportunity to access a number of virtual programs, you know, everything from exercise to cooking, to arts, to ballet, all of that's gonna be available online. Is wow. that, so is that, so I was a YMCA member of my wife and then COVID hit, and then I bought a dip power tower Okay. And a uh, pre core stretch machine for three hundred dollars. Now I never need to go to the YMCA again. Is that because of that to figure out how to get customers back that may have bought? Yeah, I mean we're we're right now we're trying to get everybody to come back uh, post COVID. Yeah, you know, um, and it's a good idea. That's yeah, program. exactly. Yeah. So um, you know, and the YMCA is a very unique offering. It's it, it's more than just a gym and swim. It's a community. Uh, organization, yeah. Um, I've heard that yeah. <laughs> It's a gym and a swim. That's what they said when I signed up. That's right. That's right. So it's uh, you know that that's what we're that's what we're trying to do. So we're just trying to bring people back. We're doing a lot of open to community events. We get a lot of turnout. Uh, we opened up our our centers as cooling centers during the summer. You know, just anything we can to get people to come in and realize you know that it's it's a it's a good experience overall. In, in addition to their health equity. So, and again, data tells the story on that, you know, because we track all those interactions. And I'm guessing the decision to do that was probably informed by what you observed with your current members. Yes. And then knowing that there, there's an industry trend towards more virtual fitness yeah. stuff, there, right? There is. Yes. Yeah. So, so that, I mean, to answer your question, that's kind of an approach. You look at what's going on macro in your industry and your target audience, and you look at how you're, current customer base is behaving and you can make uh, interpretations and develop new products or programs to test out. I could link from Peloton, like, hey, Peloton, they're at home. We could, right. You could get our videos on your iPad and use your bike that doesn't have the Peloton function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great questions, yeah. So that's what you'll modify it too. If, if the program, you'll modify it as it goes and you get additional We can continue to iterate, yeah, absolutely. That, and that's the end of the rest of the, the rest of the country is watching us because all the other YMCAs have uh, the virtual offering. Um, and some of them charge just for the virtual offering. But this is the first time you've combined it with a, an in-center experience. Nice. So. Do I see another hand? I, did. Um, I saw that hand. I have kind of a career service type question. Um, how do you see public relations and events type jobs and roles in the marketing umbrella are they a specialty within marketing or is this a totally different animal because students often are confused when they say marketing they really mean i want to be a wedding planner um <laughs> so i i think it's going to vary by company um so in my opinion for for me i want pr under marketing i want community relations under marketing I want event planning under marketing. I think those are all like marketing functions, um, but a meeting planner is not a corporate event planner. Like those, those are different skill sets. And I think that that's, that gets lost on some people. Um, but I've worked in organizations where PR did not report up to marketing. And I think that causes conflict. I think it, it's not the best case solution, but I'd be curious to hear what the other panelists think. I can jump in on that because the agency that I worked at, it was really an event agency, right? And I was, I came in as kind of the lone marketer. So Freemind does a ton of Microsoft events. They saw an opportunity to bring in someone with an event and a marketing background, which was me. 
to add value to these contracts they were getting. But it was one of those dynamics where, um, as the loan marketer, um, everything had to go through the events team, which did cause a lot of friction, especially um, as I got to know the client better and I got to know what they wanted and, you know, communication part, right? Um, yeah, it can, it can cause some issues, but I, I think you would be better served, like you said, if, if everybody was under that same umbrella with the same, everybody has a, that's all marketing functions, right? Like we were all on the same team, but certain decisions felt like we were kind of battling. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 you mentioned that and I was like, oh man, I, I know this horror story. It can be a horror story. It doesn't have to be though. Um, which is, you know, then they were like, hey, well, Microsoft's fine. You have this small business and nonprofit background, freelancing. How about you just head that up? And that was kind of like to get me out of their hair with Microsoft things, which was fine because we killed it. But um, I don't know. I just I just wanted to add that too, since because I, I remember experiencing that and feeling like, why are these things different? They're not. We're all on the same team. We're all, we all have the same goal in mind. But you're all working from the same plan. Yeah. And if your accountability paths diverge, that that creates friction. So that's why I agree with what they both say. Good question. Thanks, yeah. Okay. Any other audience questions right now? I'll go back to my prepared prepared ones then. Okay. So we, we talked a little bit about this, uh, but more specifically, how can somebody land their first marketing job? What advice do you have? Anything we haven't mentioned already? Talk about the importance of, of, of internships and putting yourself out there. The other thing is, you might think you want to work for a big company, and maybe that eventually will happen. But don't discount small companies mm -hmm. because a lot of times, small companies supply larger companies. And when they get to know you, it's face to face. People get to know you. That's when you make it higher at maybe the place you want to ultimately work. Yeah. My, um, I can only speak from my experience, but it was two things that I did. One, um, I was entrepreneurial enough to do some of the things and put out some of the. It's like I started my own events in Tacoma and marketing those festivals and those events. Um, I had my own festival downtown from 2010 to 2012, 2009 to 2012. And that one event got me to network with other events in town. And I ended up running those events. So then after a few years, it was kind of like I ran every event in Tacoma in some capacity except for Fourth of July. But every art fair, every street festival I was involved with at some, some level. And so it was a combination of just kind of like seeing that there was this environment here in Tacoma that was really friendly to these events and creating my own and being stupid enough to do that because I had no idea what I was doing. An event creation, festival creation is hard. Um, and then, yeah, just the, the, the willingness to know that that wasn't my end goal, though. Like, I wasn't creating this event to just be the guy who created an event. I wanted to network with these other events and meet other people who were putting them on and get into their organizations and, and build up a portfolio that then, you know, I was thinking, I've always thought five, seven years down the line. I don't know why. I don't even know if I'm going to live that long, but I've always done it since I was a kid. Like, oh, like five years, I'm going to be doing this. Um, but I had this thing of just knowing that starting Grid City Fest, that's going to lead to X, Y, Z and go after it and get it. And it happened three years running it. Did well. It wasn't Obviously, it's not around anymore, so it wasn't that well. But, you know, it did get me to the next level in the game, if you will. So yeah, just sometimes you gotta have enough belief in your ability to just say, I'm gonna try and create something 
and and sometimes that means asking some asking for favors and and dipping into your community resource and Tacoma is great about that I don't I mean I'm not producing events or freelance marketing or working at an agency anymore but when I decided to be down here back in 06 when I was like 22 or whatever um yeah it was just a thing of I could be here or I could be in Seattle and be no one but here there seemed to be an ecosystem growing where I felt like my skill set could thrive. And so it did, but I had to be, you know, I didn't have any responsibilities there either. There was no, <laughs> there was no, no kids, no wife, no, no, none of that stuff. And so, yeah, while y'all are young and you can do those things, you can, you know, what's that saying in tech? Oh, well, fail fast or whatever that you, yeah, go ahead and try out your silly idea and just learn from it and you'll never know where it takes you. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> agree with everything Quincy has uh, said and uh, Greg as well. Showing that initiative, uh, showing that, you know, you can get out there and make something happen, even if it's in your day to day job. I when I was going through school, I, you know, I tried to try marketing things when I was working for small companies and, you know, uh, that as long as you're showing an interest in an ideation around it, uh, and then again, building up your portfolio, either by pursuing these ideas or doing something within the community, being involved, uh, I think that that gives you a lot of a huge leg up over other candidates. And if, if I could piggyback off of what Scott said, I think the networking component that I, th I think Greg mentioned also, um, really important, get involved in local marketing groups. There's you know, the American Marketing Association, the Direct Marketing Association, they have local chapters. Um, they probably have scholarships or, or young professional groups. Um, it's a great way to get to know people. And just through word of mouth, it's a, that's how you start to, to make connections and get jobs. Um, I can't tell you how many people I've hired that knew somebody who knew somebody, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and you just throw up, throw out the word, Hey, I'm looking for this role. We actually had an intern from UWT who said, Oh, my boyfriend's looking for a job in that. So he works for us now. And it was just by word of mouth. Um, so I, I think that that's really important. Um, I would also say, um, you may not get your dream job right out of the gate. <laughs> and, you don't say <laughs> it, and it's, it's okay. Um, it's okay to start in something that isn't quite what you thought you wanted to do. So you just have to get your feet wet. And I think it's really important. Right. Please, this, this is Angie. She's our talent acquisition. Specialist. Yeah. 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 So I do recruiting for Sound Credit Union. So um, I just partner with Ryan whenever he's hiding, uh, hiring for his team. And I think I want to just reiterate everything they said is 100% true. I think the biggest piece, like Scott talking about, like what can you guys do as students right now sitting in this room, the community involvement piece, the club and organization piece, like when I'm screening for our internship program, you kind of imagine everyone's applying with a concentration in you know, marketing and a business, we're getting their business degree at UW Tacoma. How does your resume stand out? Well, a leadership role for a club or an organization that automatically puts you at a different tier than someone who chose not to do that. Um, even thinking about the work experience you're doing, even if it's not an internship is important. If you can go for those internships, absolutely. But just sitting in this room right now, volunteer somewhere, raise your hand for a club, even be the secretary, volunteer to run their social media channels. Like those are real things you can put on the resume today to make yourself stand out that aren't huge, you know, 20 or 30 hour a week time commitment things. So I think that's a really great point. And I think we're coming out of a pandemic, like get back out there and start meeting people. And as Ryan said, networking is huge. That's how I found my role at Sound Credit Union. Um, so I think those are really great pieces. So it's great to hear it, not just from a recruiter. So thanks guys. She's the gatekeeper. So you have to get through her before you get to us. So, so it's important what she says. So you mentioned the pandemic, which is a great, great segue into the next question. So what's it like to work in an office today? Or do we even work in offices? <laughs> so, yeah. I'm hearkening back to office space and, uh, you know, <laughs> the office, uh, it's, uh, it's coming back. Um, I still work from home probably 80% of the time right now. 
Uh, but um, it's funny, you know, uh, I don't like being a Zoom character. I really don't. Um, and going back to the point I made earlier about building relationships, uh, doing that in person, having those uh, opportunities to interact face to face, especially with your own team uh, in the moment, you know, not uh, at between one and two o'clock with a meeting agenda, but having genuine organic conversations with people, uh, the, that, that adds a lot to creativity, to team building, to rapport, to culture. Uh, so, you know, um, I, don't, I, don't think, uh, I don't think offices are, we're gonna see it right now. I mean, we're, the governor's turning off all the emergencies as of October 31st. Uh, um, it'll be interesting to see what, what companies say. Yeah. So Quincy, you're, you run a retail operation, so it's probably a little bit different for you. Retail, wholesale, e-commerce, I'm, I'm okay, always you running. Okay. I'm running. Yeah. I don't even, I, so look, <laughs> so we, we're moving the roastery to Road Center on Broadway. We used to be in a building on McKinley where I had an office. I was never in there. Um, just, I just never was. I would try to take meetings and stuff, Zoom calls, set up my little desk and do not nah, just but what what coming out of the pandemic you know for me tends to look like now is i am having to like have this bird's eye view and look at the trends that i see happening in our company where things that were super popping at the top of the pandemic are not anymore and so i'm in this space of constantly checking in you know i'm with my roasters i'm with uh you know the the baristas at the shop i was just in there earlier today slinging lattes but it's more of to like to get a vibe on how the workflow is going because and where that output is going to because having e-commerce retail store plus wholesale you know at the top of the pandemic it was all e-commerce I mean, it was our online, and our online store is still really well, doing really well, but now we're seeing how wholesale is picking up. We got a big contract with Trader Joe's or whatever, but now we're starting to see these other smaller and mid-sized grocers, hey, look, our, our traffic's picking up. We saw you. So it's just trying to get a vibe for where this thing is going because we had a plan and then that got squashed by the pandemic. We had to make a new plan. And now we're having to reanalyze the entire flow of everything because the world is getting back to a space that we as a business don't know. We got started in March 27, 2020, we turned on the online store because the shop couldn't get open. So all we knew was acting in the pandemic. Now we're like, okay, so this is life coming out of a pandemic and it's unique. I've never dealt with this as a marketer, as a business owner, as anything, office I have no clue about because we don't have really an office that anybody uses. But uh, yeah, that's that's just where we're at, man. It's, it's like this, I almost feel like I'm holding my business under a microscope as if I wasn't doing that already, but now I really feel like I'm sharpening the focus on that lens and watching the movements of the little squiggly things in the Petri dish because I need to track where they're going because they haven't moved like this before. So it's it's just a fascinating time um, to be in the space we're in. Yeah, great, great. I was just gonna say, I think it's gonna be different and that's really the only thing I, I, I can really figure out. I think that, um, it's we're still finding out what people's preferences are and what's best. I I suspect you're going to see a lot of hybrids and a lot of a lot of things. Um, just to get academic, we did a paper many years ago outside my area, really, but it was on channels of distribution. There was a bunch of stuff that came out. And said, oh gosh, it's so great that people have disability. They have they they have disagreements. It's task conflict, but it's so much better for the organization. They make so much mm -hmm. better better uh, decisions. And we said, well, maybe. As long as they know each other and they, informally, otherwise task conflict becomes emotional within seconds, and then we have a big problem on our hands. So 
I think you're going to see situations where people are there at least some time. Like I think a lot of offices will maybe go to three days a week. That's my best guess. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's going to really depend on the company. So, I mean, I've just seen some companies are hundred percent remote. They went remote during the pandemic and they're never coming back. They've, they've, they've gotten rid of any office space they had and they're just a completely virtual company now. Others like sound, we held onto our office space. We're expanding office space. So to your point, we're, we're, we're required three days a week. I'm personally in about four days a week. Um, I have some latitude with my team, but as a, if I hire somebody new, I require them to be there three days a week for the first 90 days. And that's, that's because I want to build that relationship with my new person, with my new, new teammate. Um, so we can have those, those conversations, those conflicts, those disagreements. And I think that that friction leads to better creativity. Um, so um, I would maybe recommend if you're given the option, lean a little bit more towards in the office in the beginning. I think it's going to help you build relationships with your leaders, um, with your peers, and then, then maybe you can kind of pull back. If that's an option, that, I think that's probably the best way to go. I see Sokatia smiling because that's that's exactly what we did with her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had a quick question directly. So, uh, how do you get those contracts with Trader Joe's or those small grocery stores? I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> and I, I'm the right person to ask, but I'm really the wrong person to ask. We, so our situation is unique in that we have been very fortunate that all of that has come to us. I have not had to go out and play offense yet, which is kind of scary um, because you don't know when that's going to stop, right? Like you have, at some point, they're going to stop knocking and you're going to have to go track down some business. But to, to, this, to this point, they've all lit up the email, go get old goodies at welovecampfire.com. Like, hey, I'm so-and-so from this company. Can you get this 400,000 pounds of coffee a year? Absolutely. No, I can't, but I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> so, that's, yeah, I mean, you know, back when I was in agency life and we were out there tracking down business, yeah, there's a whole sales process. You're going to hear a hundred no's for you hear yes and all of that. And, but that's a whole different, you know, I don't, these buyers with retailers and, you know, mom and pop stores and, big corporations, you know, it's, it's fascinating for me anyway, because I try to find out, wow, how'd you hear about us? Because for all the cool stuff we've done, we're still only two years in and we're experiencing growth that some companies don't get until year five, seven, nine, 11. And so it, it, to me, I'm trying to find a path in which I can go out and adequately have the conversations with grocery buyers because I've never dealt with that world before. They're literally just coming to me with an order and saying, can you take it or can you not? I don't know, man. I know that doesn't really answer your question, but that's what I got. Yes. I have a question. Um, how do you all stay um, a cut above amongst competition? And then further, how do you strategize customer acquisition? <laughs> so how, how do we say it cut above the competition and how do we strategize customer acquisition? She didn't come to play no game. Yeah, I just started the MBA program right away. So right. I'm actually a paralegal, but yeah. Um, so cut above the competition. Yeah. We, we analyze our competitors. Okay. Um, and we want to know what, uh, how we compare from a, like say a net promoter score uh, compared to, to them. Uh, we want to know what their weaknesses are and where our gaps lie. And so that's how we build our strategies uh, uh, accordingly. We cover our gaps and we expose their weaknesses. Um, so for, that's, that's just purely from a competitive standpoint. Okay. Um, and again, at the YMCA, we have a very unique offering. There's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of gyms out there that, that you know, there's a lot of Planet Fitnesses and whatnot that are, you know, 10 bucks a month, but they don't have pools. They don't have indoor tracks. They don't have programming, youth sports, uh, and that's all inclusive. So that's where we try to stand above. Um, plus, what are we doing within the community? Uh, 
you know, we're, we're getting the word out from a PR standpoint about, you know, hey, you know, last year we helped out 1,100 kids in foster care by giving them free memberships. A lot of people don't know that stuff and don't know those stories. So we're also telling our impact story along with our consumer story. Um, so that's, that's uh, staying a cut above the competitor. Um, sorry, part two of your question. <laughs> um, how do you strategize customer acquisition? Okay, so um, strategizing customer acquisition. So it's a little bit different, again, for the, at least for the why, um, and, uh, it, it, which is also different from a B2B format. But what, what we try to do is uh, we want to be able to appeal to as many people as we possibly can. So a lot of that has to do with uh, the same type of um, storytelling and, uh, you know, are we, are we offering the, the, the right people the right part of our story? Because the why is so expansive, it could overwhelm people. And they don't have enough time to hear about all the things that we do. So we need to be able to focus in on them from a, from a, marketing, or from a uh, marketing automation standpoint and know what their preferences are and get those messages in front of them. So if they're interested in Zumba classes or, or if they're interested in specific program, if they're interested in youth sports for their kids, we're making sure that those messages are reaching them before the other messages. So that, um, uh, so that, that helps us from a retention standpoint. Uh, new customer acquisition, try stuff. <laughs> See what works. Try, try stuff, look at the data, iterate, try again. Yeah. Quincy or Greg, would you add to that? I, I can jump in. Um, yeah, to Scott's point, it's, it's the story. I believe in our story because it's ours. Nobody else has it. So in terms of competition, that story, we're fortunate that communicating it is pretty easy. The name is also our roasting method. We actually roast over an open flame campfire. The only ones in the country that do that. Interesting. So really the, the task at hand for us is continuing to refine that story, right? And depending on who we're talking to, making sure that the sticky points stick. But it's also a little bit tough because as part of our story, people immediately will take our identity and run with certain parts of it, right? And what I mean by that is we're also the only Black female and veteran-owned roaster in the country. In that you got three groups that want to jump on one part of it and run with that. So the challenge for us is making sure that not only is that cohesive, and never get stripped apart, but also why we even exist in the first place never leaves the message. And it ain't got nothing to do with coffee, surprise, surprise. Our whole thing is about getting more people, more access to outdoor recreation and education, period. We believe that coffee is just has a great utility to hold a conversation. So I don't understand the people that like sell like $30 bags of coffee. That shit's weird to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not like, yeah. it's not like a nice Italian bag that's yeah. been hand stitched with yeah. this premium leather. Like I'm selling the same coffee they're selling at their sell. Yeah. I'm buying the same green coffee from the same farms. So we use that to have a bigger and broader conversation. And that's exactly where I try to stay a cut above the rest in that. Yeah, second part of the question, what was that? A strategized customer acquisition. So strategizing the customer acquisition, again, for, for us on a day-to-day, -day, and I say us, me, and whoever working at the shop wants to hear me ramble, um, it's kicking around ideas of how we continue to refine that story. How do we refine it? Like, that also means that sometimes the story has no words at all. It's just where you're at. So when I think about how we're expanding as a business, where do we ultimately want to do? If we want to inspire and motivate people to get outside that might not normally get outside and camp and hike and backpack, it makes no sense for me to be in downtown Seattle. 
right? right. Like, even though there, there is a, a place and time where that would work. Um, we're in Tacoma because this is home base. This is where I was born, raised, I'm a federal way kid, but always lived in Tacoma. Um, so I think about things like we can tell our story in so many different ways than just what's on a piece of paper, what you see on social media. So when you see us pop up a store in Lake Tahoe, California in 2024, it makes sense because we want to inspire and motivate and keep people going outside. Um, so yeah, that we try to think about what that looks like, telling the story with stores or with our product, what, what shelves are we on? I mean, Trader Joe's has a customer base that I'm so glad they came to us with because I wanted to be in Trader Joe's. But not every, they don't carry a lot of private brands. They carry a lot of Trader Joe's. So when they said we had the opportunity to be our own brand in there, I jumped at it um, because they have a customer base that is excited about going to Trader Joe's. You go to Trader Joe's like you go to Target. Trader Joe's is going to tell me what I need, right? If you go to Winco, you're going for groceries. <laughs> eggs, I'm out. But we want to keep that ourselves in that part of people's psyches as often as possible. So I'm always trying to find those opportunities. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Well, let's see, with uh, customer acquisition, um, to be honest, that, that hasn't been a major focus of a lot of universities, probably yeah. including us until somewhat recently. And now we're really trying to evaluate that at this point. In fact, that's kind of an ongoing effort uh, within the school and within the university. Yeah. Um, you know, you, things are cyclical in, in academe. You, you, you know, some of it is, is based on how many, how many, basically what the demographics are. Is it a large group of college age? Also, um, what are the other opportunities? And right now we're at a time where, where it's, it's really time to evaluate that. Yeah. And I would say similarly, you know, the competition. You always know, you always look at your programs and you always look at your programs in terms of what they're, what they're delivering. But I, I think increasingly we're going to need to do more of that and put more out in the community. And I think that um, that's maybe a bit of a fault in higher ed. And I think we're in an inflection, in an inflection point. I think it's actually like a national issue, really, which, which at the local level, we're, we're, we're going to figure it out. Thanks, everybody. So we just have a couple minutes left. Any parting advice for students? Advice you'd offer? I think I've offered plenty of advice. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to come back real quick to relationships matter. So many of the, you know, uh, networking is very important. That happens through relationships. Uh, being able to communicate your ideas and your concepts and gain consensus across the organization, up through leadership, uh, with an agency or with your client uh, requires relationship building. Um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, I, I think you can't undervalue uh, and, and definitely want to keep uh, front and center because uh, at the end of the day, if anybody's having a bad experience, um, uh, you know, you, you're, putting your, you're putting yourself in your your own personal brand uh, at risk. Thanks. Quincy, how about you? Um, I really don't know. But <laughs> don't, don't be afraid to do the dirty work. Yep. <laughs> don't be afraid to do the dirty work. I, I think it's the, everything you all said is, 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 is spot on. And um, I would say, you know, show up, be out there, make the relationships, and don't be afraid to do the dirty work. There's a lot of dirty work in park. There is. There's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot. Awesome. Well, please join me in thanking our panel for. Uh, for questions and uh i think we'll all be hanging around a little bit if you have any questions for us one-on-one -on -one. uh if not thank you and uh good luck in your endeavors thank you oh, team, go.